Now, some of the other ideas that I wanted to bounce off you or think about with you are the ideas that a lot of cultures take ideas from other cultures. So, for instance, let's say that the Egyptian culture was a schema culture. And you have these symbols that have been deciphered or thought about, for instance, the um, the obelisk symbol that we have in these three images in St. Peter's Basilica and in the Washington Monument could relate, or some Egyptologists have related it to the early tales of shaping water from the chaos, and it's like the rays of sun or rays of light coming down and hardening the, the earth. But less important than that is probably how sometimes symbols are reappropriated by other cultures. So for instance, when the Italians actually went to Egypt, they took some of these obelisks with them. And if you look how this obelisk is a symbol of Egypt, and then it's been placed within the context of the arms of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, in Vatican City, in Italy, it's actually a way of saying we have some control over this. It's also a way of saying that we come from this culture and we have an understanding of our history. And the same can be said about the Washington Monument on the right-hand side. So in some ways, culture is this thing that's passed on from generation to generation, and there are these ideas behind it uh, in which you have a development of one culture developing into another culture and taking some of the ideas and trying to give them credit even physically by placing them within the monuments. Now, if you're an educated person and you know about Egyptian art, there are these conventions about the portrayal of the body in Egyptian culture that are actually kind of funny and confusing to us as people who grew up in a European, more illusionistic tradition than the Egyptians. So I got this cartoon from the New Yorker magazine, and I thought it was kind of an interesting idea because it shows how we perceive the Egyptian culture that we know about that compound body view of the, the torso being in a frontal view, the legs being in profile, and then the head being in, in profile and the eye being a frontal view. But we kind of make a joke about it. And this has to do with cultural capital and our understanding of the past and our understanding of the conventions in Egyptian art. So this convention of this compound view or composite view of the human body comes up many times in Egyptian art and is important to us in studying it. For example, we have this tomb that's actually contemporaneous or at around the same time as King Tut, probably shortly after or shortly before, and it's from a minor sort of official named Neb Amun. And Neb Amun is, these paintings are from his tomb walls, and they represent him in those same, same conventions that we saw in the palette of King Narmer. He is larger than everyone else. He is shown in, in composite view, where you can see different views of his body, for instance, the legs in profile, torso in frontal view, head in profile, but with the eyes facing forward. He is obviously the head honcho, the big guy, so behind him are lesser beings or lesser creatures, including his wife and, and some of his servants. And it also shows him in, in a heroic pose. In this instance, since he's an official, he probably wouldn't have gone to war, so he's represented as actually being a good hunter. Now, this is kind of important because, for instance, the king or pharaoh needed to be athletic and needed to be powerful. And so one of the roles he had was being a, a, a warrior leader. And so we have this translated down. It's kind of an icon of masculinity. Now, these conventions, some people have argued, are actually magical and that makes the body more complete and more more profound in some ways and has more religious power. And this might be true because if you look at other representations of the form from Neb Amun's tomb, what you'll see is actually representations of people that are sometimes in three-quarter view, sometimes in frontal view, and these are the dancing girls who he is celebrating with. And so sometimes the depiction of the important person in a tomb or in art is often represented in that composite or compound view, but then lesser people might be depicted in a lesser way because we don't really need to show them in their full magical ability. So if we pull together some of this stuff and we pull together the funerary rites and what we understand about how the king is viewed and how we have uh, the depictions of important personages and also the religion, it comes together in these so-called books of the dead. 
And the books of the dead are basically papyri, which are basically scroll books that depict the role of a person through their life, but also have religious texts in them, religious prayers. And even some of the ideas that we talked about in terms of creation. So it's almost easier to look at this in a diagram because it lays out some of the characters that we're talking about. So in the very top register, we have his soul. And the soul of, of Neb Amun is actually before all of the primordial gods. We see Shu, Tefnet, Geb, Newt, and then we have the, the less primordial gods, the primary gods, Horus, Isis, Nephthys, and they are actually kind of seated before him, and he is making supplication to them, asking them for some kind of help so that he can move forward through life. Then if we look beneath him, he, it, it actually shows his pathway through life, and there's going to be a lot of books of the dead that look almost exactly like this. So we have, as as he is being ushered into basically judgment, he comes in and he is led by Anubis, who is this jackal-headed god. Anubis sometimes is, is related to Seth, but Anubis is a slightly different god, and it relates the, the jackal composite or compound of the human body with the jackal head actually relates to what we know the qualities of the jackal have. For example, the jackal would hang out in graveyards because it preferred decayed meat. So it would make sense that Anubis is the god of the dead and is going to be ushering him in for judgment. So he walks in to this judgment and Anubis is sort of presiding over this and he is actually weighing his heart, weighing Neb Amun's heart against a feather from the goddess Ma'at, who is the goddess of justice. And if he doesn't pass muster, if his heart is heavier than the feather of the goddess of justice, then Amit, who is this sort of hippo, rhinoceros, um, lion-headed god, can devour his heart and he won't make it any further. And interestingly enough, we have this ibis-headed god named Thoth, who is actually going to be recording the events as it happens. So he passes judgment, and of course he would, and so he's able to enter into the Hall of Judgment and into the uh, the Great Square or the Tree of Life. And of course, we have Osiris with the Crooked Fail, and Isis and Nephthys, all of the primary gods, and even Horus, who is presiding over it and helping him come in. So the, the prince is ushering him into the Hall, and so Neb Amun will be able to be reborn again into basically the kingdom of Osiris, and he will be regenerated, and he will be able to live on and on and on. So we see all of those same kinds of things in the original story or the original mythology that we looked at. Interestingly, this could relate to, for instance, the funerary battery banner of Lady Di, in which we kind of have a layout of the cosmos or the universe where we have a sort of underworld and then we have our world and then we have the heavens and uh, Lady Di has ascended and that could be her in the very center of that image when we look at that. And we have similarities even in terms of the style and formal attributes in Mayan art, for instance, this Mayan cup that represents God El with the Muan bird on his head, and he is uh, meeting probably with a dignitary. This might be one of the hero twins who is coming in, and he is seated on a, uh, on a throne or a dais, and he is being ushered in. And the, the gods of Shibalba are actually much less pleasant than the gods of the ancient Egyptian um, pantheon. But we, we have a sort of similar iconography. And even the space that's being created, everything's put up against the front of the picture plane. Everything's in profile. The gods are usually larger than the other creatures. There are various depictions of the Book of the Dead that have the same kind of iconography. For instance, this papyrus of Ani. And we see that it's, this is from later, about 100 years after the papyrus of Neb Amun. But it shows the same theme and the same kinds of elements. We see Amit, we see Thoth, we see Anubis, and we see Ani being judged. 
An interesting element is that as we go through time and we get into Ptolemaic Egypt, in which the Greeks actually have control or primacy of the Egyptian world, uh, the, the Alexander invades, and then we have this sort of generation after generation of, of Egypt being controlled by the Greeks. We have the same kind of iconography, but there's kind of a decay or the style changes or morphs over time, and we have a difference in schema and correction. And it's not like the original style. It seems to be less refined. It seems to have less of an understanding of the original conventions of Egyptian art. So when we look at Neba Amun's wall painting, we kind of get a lot of the same kind of ideas that he is larger than the other people, he is in sort of that smiting pose, he is represented in compound view. Now, tomb painting that we've looked at is also significant because the spirit of the dead, when that person was actually mummified, would go for a walk and would be able to enter into these wall paintings. So it was important to have representations inside the tomb so that the ka or spirit of the dead person could actually inhabit it. And as I pointed out before, one of the things that you would have to have you know, is that a lesser person would be represented in a sort of more naturalistic way. It's less important for them to be represented realistically. But you also need to have servants in your tomb as well. So one of the things that you would have in your tomb are things that you would need in your afterlife to keep you entertained. And of course, um, dancing girls might be one of those things if you're used to that in your life and you can have images of them as well. And when you compare the two, you can see that the dancing girls are represented sometimes as much more naturalistic, although they still tend to do a lot of the same things between the two figures. The idea of naturalism versus realism is also kind of important in terms of representations of other people that would have been included in your tomb. So if we look at this sculpture of Mycerinus and Camerer Nepti from around 2500, which is in the Old Kingdom, and from a, a, another representation, actually, I believe this is in wood and it's been polychromed with some plaster over it, this he described from a tomb in Saqqara, we have a representation of a scribe, and scribes were actually like the secretaries. They were the admin assistants of the ancient world, and they would have been represented in a very naturalistic way. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is the difference in idealization between these two. For instance, the scribe is kind of flabby, he's kind of fat. And for us, while that doesn't represent us um, a, an ideal person, someone who goes to the gym, for instance, in our culture, being kind of flabby, being kind of fat means that you're actually wealthy enough to be able to be that way. And scribes were actually the executives of that world because being able to write and record things was an important skill. So you would need a sculpture of a scribe in your tomb in order to actually have someone to do that for you when you got to the afterworld. And when you represent the king and the queen, you represent them more idealized. And probably the king is represented as sort of wasp-waisted with very strong musculature because he is actually a warrior and he has to be represented as being physically able to conduct war. So the Egyptians had this idea that the tomb needed to be complete and the tomb needed to be a complete kind of living arrangement for the soul, the ka, the spirit of the person who was going to inhabit it. Um, they do have a, a distinction between the personality or essence of the person, which is the ba, and then the actual full spirit, which is the ka. And you might want to look into that a little bit more deeply. So when we see representations of kings and uh, royalty, very often they're idealized as being very physically fit. And we have a convention in which they are standing in this very blocky pose with one step forward. And we're going to see this again in other cultures as well. And they, uh, of course, the king wears a beard, which is a representation of his power as well. And those beards were actually fake beards. And then that headdress that he's wearing, which uh, could represent a cobra. The idea of naturalism being included in a tomb isn't uncommon, and it seems like there are actually similar 
occurrences of this, for instance, the Qin warriors that we see from the Qin emperor, uh, we see naturalistic representations of warriors that the king would have wanted to take with him to the afterlife. So the idea of being able to take it with you, I guess, is something that comes across several different cultures and several different times that we believe that if we make a sculpture of someone that we need in the in the real world, when we get to the afterlife, that person might be available to us then. Representations of kings and queens also follow certain kinds of conventions. So for instance, one of the interesting things about this in terms of the iconography of color is that men were represented as darker than the, than the women, and they would have used a darker kind of ochre paint to represent Prince Rehotep than his wife Nofret. And so that's kind of an interesting idea as well that the skin color represents gender in the Egyptian culture. Now she's actually wearing a wig, so that's kind of important. And the kind of gown that she's wearing is, is significant too because it would have been a highly starched gown that would have been very stiff and he's wearing a skirt that's like that too. And one of the things that you'll see in representations of a lot of princes and kings and, and royalty is that they wear a, a starched kind of kilt that would be would remain unwrinkled and would remain pure white because it represents power. Now from a formal point of view, some of the other things are important about looking at Egyptian sculpture. One of the things that how Egyptian sculpture was made really influences how it looks. So for instance, it's made out of a single block of stone and they would draw a figure on the front part and then draw a figure on the side part and then carve away a sort of in a grid pattern until they got down to the body of the figure. And so that's why it kind of looks blocky and it looks based on a geometric form. And that's an important convention in Egyptian art because we see this over and over again in the forms and in the sculpture that the figure looks almost like it's carved from a block of stone and seems to project out in that way. Another idea then is that Egyptian art is meant to be seen really from one point of view, which is the front point of view. And we're going to see a frontal point of view in other cultures. For instance, this Kouros figure, and Kouros just literally means youth figure from ancient Greece, from the archaic period, from around 600 BCE. We see this sculpture is meant to be seen also just from the front, and it shares a lot of conventions from the Egyptian um, sort of world where you see this, the stepping forward, the wasp waist, the very powerful physique, uh, even a little bit of a smile on the faces, which we sometimes refer to as an archaic smile. Now, if you look at this, this is actually a couple of thousand years after. And remember when we talked about the Egyptians and the early Egyptologists, the first ones were actually from the classical world of ancient Greece from around 450 BCE. And the reason why these uh, Herodotus and, and Manetho actually traveled to Egypt and were, were fascinated with, with ancient Egypt was because their culture, the ancient Greek culture and the classical Greek culture was based somewhat on Egyptian culture. So we can actually see this reflected in the forms of Greek sculpture and we'll see that more and more over time.